Today is September the 24th. Yes. yes. 2012. My name is Tanya Fincham along with Juliana Nicolasian. We're here in Kingfisher, Oklahoma to speak with Betty and Hugh Branscombe regarding their Centennial Farm. And this is part of the Oklahoma State University Library's Oral History Research Program. It's one of our projects within that program. So thank you so much for having us in your home today. Let's start with having one of you or both of you tell us how the family came to own this particular piece of land. Well, you were. Well, my grandfather came from Champlain, Illinois, and he came on horseback first to uh, the saloon here in Kingfisher. He knew no one in Kingfisher. So he come to the saloon and he met a Mr. Pappy and Mr. Bolenbach and he, in the conversation and everything, he was telling them that he was looking for a good piece of land that had plenty of good water. And they said, we know just the place. And so they took my grandfather out east of Kingfisher, nine and a half miles, at, to this place and he saw it and he liked it and he bought it then. And my grandfather raised horses. He, he liked to work with horses and everything. And he always raised real good quality horses that people liked to buy from him. And so that's well, when he came, was he a bachelor or was he married? He was already married and he had five children at the time. Four boys, older boys, and a, a daughter that was six months old and that was my mother. And uh, then after, after they came here, they had, uh, let's see, they had four more children. They had another daughter and a pair of twins and another daughter who died at 14 months old. And, and what was his name, your father's name, his first name? The grandfather? Yes. Felix. Felix, okay. Uh-huh. And then your grandmother? Lena. Lena. Uh-huh. And then your mother and your father? Louis and Louise Bamberg. And then how did you two end up with the property? We bought it from my aunt. My aunt and my mother inherited it from my uh, grandfather and grandma. And uh, my aunt had two thirds of the place and my mother had a third of the place. And uh, I mean, we bought it in 1966. From my aunt. From her aunt. We give 35000 for two-thirds of it. Okay. The third was in her name. And like I told you earlier, the reason that it didn't have it on her plaque there is because her name was never on the abstract. The Bamberg was never on there. But my her mother's, mother's name. That was between her sister and her sister. That's, that's the way it'd be. And so uh, they, when, when we got that plaque in 2000, they said, no, said, we won't put the Bamberg on there. We'll leave it off. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we wanted them to and, and, and didn't get it done. But nonetheless, then later years, well, then uh, we bought that place in 1966 for 35000 from my wife's aunt. And then in the latter years, well, when the folks passed away, well, then my wife inherited that third. And of course, then they had a house in town here. They had two children. They gave the son the house in town, and they gave us a third of the land, and that made about equal in, in money, you know. But that's the way they divided that up. There's never been a mortgage on the farm out there. It's never been mortgaged. And when he come and bought Sounds. it that fall, he gave $1,800 for the quarter, 160 acres. Oh, wow. And that was an enormous amount of money because there was people just a few years before that would leave from here, you know, with a grub stake and a team and wagon. They wanted to leave because it was so dry and it, it was hard work. 
and but he stayed put and he was the third generation to buy that place there was two before him one homesteaded and the guy that homesteaded sold it to another fella and her grandpa was the third owner and he gave 1800 now i don't know i can't remember what the others i'm not sure it's in the abstract when he met, went back to champaign illinois he brought the family his family back to Guthrie and he bought a team and a buggy and brought the family on to the home place out there. And was, there. was there already a house built or did you have to build one? There was a one room building, one room building and then my grandfather in the spring built the two-story part to it. We got pictures over there. See that picture over on the floor? Mm -hmm. That's the home place. Is it still standing? No. No, it's not. We standing. rebuilt in 1979 okay. and 80. We finished the pictures. house in 80. Right. My husband and three other farmers, with the help of other farmers Neighbors. along that helped maybe a day at a time, uh, built the house. I can show you, see that little girl, that's the aunt. The one right, the one right there is the aunt that we bought the place from. This is my wife's mother right here. And that picture was taken about 1903. But this barn was there when we moved there. That's a straw stack sitting back there. But her grandpa built this house that you see here. He built that after he come. That the two-story. The two-story two part. Back behind there was just one room and then a lean-to on it. And, uh, of course, I tore this down, and, and there's a picture today. Do you remember, did you spend much time in this house growing up? Yes. I you, grew up. She grew up in that house, yeah. Can you tell, talk a little bit about the inside then? Where was your room? My room was upstairs, and I had this uh, the very south room upstairs. And it was always a room that was, in the summer, cool, because it was always a cool breeze and could open the windows up and it was just really nice sleeping nice up there how was it heated it wasn't the upper part it was just the lower part the living room and dining room area and it wasn't a dining room area at one time it was a kitchen and dining room together and my dad and another farmer built the walls between the kitchen and the dining room and the living room and that was the heated part and that it was that way even well when we tore it down and rebuilt well it was still just heated the lower part like that with wood or oil or well, we had brews had to butane. Uh, it was heated with coal uh, before we got the butane. And how did you stay warm upstairs in the winter time? With lots of covers on and a hot water bottle. <laughs> so her grandpa heated with wood, I think, didn't he? He heated with wood, Betty. He didn't. He might I don't have know. Coal. It. Uh, there wasn't that much wood around Kingfisher. Uh, they, I think they got a uh, wood stove at one time there, because I can remember hearing your dad talk about them stoking the fire up at night so there'd be some coals left for the morning. You know, when they get up, then they'd throw some wood in there. I think your dad burnt wood, if I'm not mistaken. I've heard him we talk had about coal. It. You had coal, I can too. remember the coal. Yeah, well... Uh, I think people had both. They burnt some coal and some wood, you know. Or whatever they could get. Yeah. Yes. That, that corn burn. cobs, too. There's a lot of corn cob burnt. Huh? They sure well, we didn't. didn't. Well. We never had. A lot of people did burn them, old Betty, because mm -hmm. they raised corn in the, in the country at that time, and they'd yeah. feed corn to the horses, sure. and they'd sell that corn seed, and they'd have the cobs. And they, they burnt a lot of cobs. I've heard uh, your dad talk about doing cobs in the park. And they used whatever they could yeah. yeah. Did you have quilts then? Yes. And your mother or grandmother made them? Yes. 
and we had comforts, and they was thick. They was tied. They weren't quilted, mm -hmm. but she had quilts too. Had your grandfather raised horses in Illinois before he came? I think he probably had. He farmed with horses back there. Yes. And he never did have a tractor. He farmed with horses here. He he left the farm out there in 1920 and moved into town here because of his asthma condition. I don't think he ever had a tractor that I know of. I don't think my grandpa did. No. It was, he no. always did farm with horses. But he had to quit farming because of his health. And her parents got married in 1922, and they moved out on the farm, and they started farming in 1922. And what did they farm? Wheat. They had mostly wheat. Well, all wheat. And yeah, he raised some back some, here for, for hay, yeah. and then they had grass pasture, you know, for the cattle to run on. And, and, uh, but he, he did mostly wheat. Was. And they got that in 22, and then how long did they stay? They stayed till 1963. Okay. They moved to town. And we moved to. We moved there in moved 1963. There. We was married in 56 and we lived west of town. And then we moved east of town and lived on a, in a little house. And then we moved to the home place in 63. And what did you raise? We and hay, yeah, wheat and hay is all we ever raised. And how long did you do that? We did that until the, the 1998, from 63 to 98. We moved into here in 1998. Well, you, you still farmed some. Well, I farmed after we'd been here for a few years, but we, we moved off the place in 1998. Hard to give it up? Yes, yeah, it was yeah. hard to give it up. There was a, this daughter of ours and her family lived in a trailer house. We have the quarter right east of this quarter. They lived on it, and they had three boys, and they were getting up pretty good size where they were bouncing off the walls, you know, of the house. And so we just moved to town a little earlier than we anticipated. But this area, well, this area here, come up for sale, and their neighbors over It here, was just being developed, this yeah, little area where all this cult sack. 18 houses. Uh -huh. 18 houses. Yeah, and we there. stopped at one of the neighbors here and visited with them. Uh, we had drove by the property. We knew the property and everything. And drove by the property and you said, when we moved to town, this is where I'd like to be, this area. And so we stopped in at the neighbors over here and visited with them and they telling us about the area and everything. And, uh, we decided, well, we check into it and we checked into it and this where our house is standing, we decided was an ideal area. And it was only place, only area on this side that didn't have a house on it yet. Yeah, we were first to build it on this side. And uh, so we had two years decided these the guy that sold the property said two years was you knew you had to build on it. And so we decided well just as well go ahead and build, you know. So we did, and uh, we moved in here in January of 98, and then our kids moved into the house on the, out on the farm uh, in uh, April, I think it was. Anyway, a couple months later, and uh, that's... That second picture is the home place today. It's behind there. That's what it looks like today. Wasn't it's a bigger it? house than what this is. But then we decided we wanted a smaller house because we weren't going to get younger. We knew that. And we knew as we got older, we didn't want all that upkeep. And my husband said he didn't want to have to mow lawn. We had a big lawn at home. And uh, so... We decided on this place and 
I got it all cement so he don't have to mow. <laughs> and I got a smaller house, so, and lots of times I wish for more room because I got stuff stuck everywhere. And, well, but. I mean, if you want to play in the dirt, you can go back out to the place. Yeah, well, I got these little flower beds I play in the dirt here. <laughs> I always had a big garden out home. Did lots of canning. And how had you learned to do that? My mother. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure she learned from her mother. So if it hadn't been for the garden, we might have starved to death. We, uh, we had to raise our food, a lot of it, you know. And the generation before us, they didn't hardly buy groceries. They, they bought just necessities. Salt, pepper, and sugar, coffee. They raised what they ate. And the generation before that is her grandpa. He used to buy sugar by the 100 pound sacks, carried upstairs down, stored in that house. They, they, they stored it upstairs, and he'd buy apples by the wagon load. He'd go across the Cimarron River and buy a wagon load of apples, $2. There used to be a lot of orchards over by Dover. $3. Well, it was $3. $3. Well, anyhow, he'd get a bunch of apples, and they'd bring them back over here, and they'd slice those, put them up on the chicken house on a sheet. On a screen. And they dry those apples from the sunlight. And I don't know what kept the birds from eating them, but they must have had some way. Of I don't think them. they had the birds then like we have now. But they dry the, the apples and they pretty well raised what they ate because, you know, they didn't have any money. It was uh, pretty rough on 1900. <laughs> Did they have a cellar? Yes. Yeah, yeah they had a cellar. They raised. We raised a lot of potatoes and uh, had a big garden out there uh, just south of the house there is where the garden was. We did that too and we just raised two children. But uh, yeah, we used to milk cows and we made our living with their milk cows and their baby calves, you know. That kept us going. Had a dairy or just? No, it wasn't just a real was... dairy, it just enough to that we survived. We also. sold cream. Yeah, we sold cream. And, and I can remember $56. Uh, the cream check was $59. And uh, for two weeks, uh, we got the check. And uh, I'd come to town and I'd buy groceries and then buy take care of all of our groceries and everything because I had canned lots too. And um, just... Yeah, it was a little different. We, we seen some pretty rough time, but nothing like the generation before us. And then her grandparents went through a lot more. I was born at Okima. I don't know if you know where Okima is or not, but I was born there. And I come to Kingfisher in 1948, and uh, I worked for some people here in Wheat Harvest. That's the reason I come to this county. I was looking for work, see. And I come up here with three other brothers, or three other buddies, and we worked for people out there. And then I'd worked, been up here, and then in 1950, one well, of the folks I worked for wanted me to stay there with them and help them do chores and finish my last year of high school at a little consolidated school out there called Big Four. And so I helped them do their chores. They milked, I think, nine cows. And her knees was bad. She couldn't get down on the milk stool and milk. Milk by hand, didn't have milk in the same seat. And uh, so they wanted me to help them do chores. And they sent me to school my last year of high school. So that's how we met, really. Is she was a senior and I was a senior that year. And uh, I don't know if she winked or I winked, but the other than winked back. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. <laughs> But uh, that's what started. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was in school. That's how I come to Kingfisher. And, and what year were you born then? I was born in 1932. 1932. And roughly the same. I was 33. Uh -huh. So when you got married, when? 56. 56, 56 yeah. Oh, that was a courtship then. <laughs> yeah, I was married in 1956. Of course, I was overseas before that. I was drafted in there in the army, you know, in the Korean conflict, I was drafted. And uh, then when I come home, I think it's about a year, year and a half. Yeah, you know, so. we were married then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, it is. It was something all right, but then we made it, and for her help, she's had a little bit rougher time than I have. I've been knocked down with cancer. I had 12 inches of my colon taken out in uh, 99. We'd been in here about a year, a little over, and uh, I uh, was sowing wheat that fall, and uh, I had a terrible pain, and uh, I noticed uh, in the stool blood. And I said, well, I got to finish sewing. And I didn't realize what the problem was. See, I thought, well, just something broke loose in there. I got through sewing. I didn't even put the machinery up. I just pulled everything home. Went to the doctor the next day. And uh, he found out that what the problem was. In two days, they took 12 inches of my colon out. And uh, so that was a knockdown for me then. And, uh, and then I've had another operation since then. Didn't amount to much. But she's had a little more problems than I have. Betty's had her chest open twice, bypass surgery, times. and uh, she's had her back surgery now, the 30th of July. They cut her about 18. I've got a pacemaker, and they've also, just this year before I had my back surgery, they had to put a balloon and a stent in my heart. Artery. Or they wouldn't operate on my back. That's why it took so long. I was in the nursing home from uh, the last of April until um, about, about the first, first of August. First of August, I mean, yeah. I had my surgery, back surgery. It's better that you were here then on the farm then. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you remember when electricity came to the farm? 19... 38, I believe it was. Uh, uh, where I was born, we didn't get electricity until about 42. You know, they was a lot later in that area. But I worked as a little boy. That's one of the first jobs I ever had from the farm. I was raised on a farm myself. One of the first jobs I had was when they come through the country building uh, electric lines, some of the big trees, they'd just side trim them, cut the limbs off of the side. They would take the whole tree out. And they called me the paint boy because I was real small and I could take a, a can and, and paint and I'd skin up that tree, paint those knots where they sawed the limbs off. And uh, I got, for six days, I got $35. I was in tall cotton. <laughs> six days of work. That was, That's you know, pretty good. Yeah, but... pretty, we worked Saturdays and all. And they were coming through um, putting electricity through the country. And the purpose mm -hmm. for the paint was? Well, they didn't want the trees bleeding, so I guess they thought. It wasn't really a paint, it was some kind of preservative. Creosote. I don't know if Probably. it was creosote, I can't remember what it was, but it kind of kept the trees from bleeding. You know, they'd be green, see, when they would cut the limbs off. And I'd paint those sides uh, where they cut it off, I'd paint that. And that's the first job I had away from the farm. And then I guess when I got a little older, I must have been about 14. Back then, they didn't worry about the kid being too little. You could just work your you get a job, you work, you know. Now you got to be a certain age before you can get a job. And it wasn't that way back then. And uh, then I guess, uh, uh, come to Kingfisher then in 1948, working in wheat harvest. Yeah. Uh, when we got electricity, I think the first, one of the first things that my mom got was uh, iron. And we got a washing machine and a radio. And uh, we didn't get a refrigerator until it was 1946. And the reason for that was the war in the meantime broke out and rationing and everything. And, and you know, you had to have your name on a list. And I'm sure that the list contained people that there was preferences, you know. But anyway, uh, I can remember for harvest, for the guys that, uh, what do I want to say, the guy that did the... Well, they thrashed with thrashing. Thrashing, machine. yeah, thrashing, thrashing was what I was trying to think of. Uh, Mom and Dad would get two 100-pound blocks of ice and put them in our basement. And our basement was always cool. 
and they wrap them in in the clips, comforts and paper, and you know, to paper to insulate them, and uh, they'd have ice for during the harvest, and uh, she'd make homemade, she'd make her own lemonade and everything, and it was delicious, and for the men. And at that time, they <laughs> feed a breakfast, dinner, and supper, you mm -hmm. know. The men would stay, usually when they were thrashing, they'd stay on the place where they were working. And uh, they'd have to bathe in a horse tank. Uh, you know, they didn't have facilities back then like they did. Some of them had a tank up on a building, and they'd get on it and just let the water run on. But that's the way they did for cleaning up. And like you said, they had breakfast, dinner, and supper. That's where they were thrashing. And then they'd move on down the road to the next neighborhood. That's a lot of work for everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the women back then shot wheat. You know what? They they bound it from a field. They used a binder and then make a shock. You, you know what a shock of wheat is? Kind of it. Well, it's a bundle about this big around, and the wheat would be about that tall. And, and they'd had a carrier on that binder. And you carry so many bundles, and when you got the carrier full, then you drop them off. And then the women would help, and they'd come and just gather that wheat up, and they'd shock it. And it'd stay in that shock until the thrashing machine come along. See, there wasn't a lot of them. It just, you'd have to wait till you get somebody to come thrash your wheat. It might be August before you get it thrashed. It depends on when they come around, you know. And uh, but what she's saying is they had that ice there just for harvest. They didn't keep it that way. Uh, uh, not all year round. Right. Now, in the wintertime, if they wanted ice, they'd go to the uh, pond oh, yeah. and break ice off a pond. I know uh, we used to go get ice for my mother, and she'd make us snow ice cream. ice cream out of snow, if you ever heard of that. And the snow would have to be cleaned. We used to have big snow, it seemed like years ago, but we don't have much anymore. And uh, she'd make ice cream for us, and we'd have, uh, she'd also make it in the freezer too, but we'd have to get the ice from a pond. You know, break ice. We didn't have, you didn't buy ice in town, or we didn't. <laughs> well, speaking of ponds, how many ponds were on the, on your place? On the family okay, place? there's one big, pretty good sized pond, and the other pond joins, half of it is on one of our places, and the other half is on the other. It's right on the half mile line. Yeah, it's on the half mile line. It's a bigger pond, and that's where the cattle would drink, you know. Were they man-made or were they natural, do you know? No, they were man-made. Man-made. Yeah. yeah. Her dad built the one that she's talking about because he, uh, when he, he bought the quarter east of where her home place is, that's when he built the pond because the draw run down through there, and it was right on the half-mile line. And so he built this pond pretty good size, but it's built on two quarters, you know. The pond just separates the places. So if you went to sell it, it might, might be an issue then? It yes, would be it an issue. Be. It, uh, of course, we've got it fixed where it won't be sold. It'll come on down to the kids that were just here. Her and her family would get that. And then we've got other land for the other daughter. The other daughter. We, got, uh, we have two daughters. She teaches school and her husband is in it. And so we, we got it all. Uh, everything is fixed out. So if we die, they know just what's what. Well, that's good. Yeah, it's all been fixed out several years, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. And, uh, we tried to do it like the folks before us done. Uh, Betty, uh, Betty uh, like I say, it's her side of the family. But she agreed to everything, and she had a brother, and her folks had a half section. And so she, they gave her brother a quarter of land. And they gave her this quarter that joined the home place. So we've got a half section together out there. And that's how her brother got his quarter. It was where her dad was raised. And his name is Bamberg. So well, see, my aunt owned most of the place we're talking about. The home place. And yeah. my mother had a third. Well, I got the third. And uh, then uh, my dad bought the what we call the east place, which joins the home place, which makes a half section. And so I got the east place, 
and my brother got his got the Bamberg place where the Bambergs settled. Where the Bamnet be her father. And uh, yeah, my dad's place. And he also got the house that mom lived in here in town. Plus some cash. They gave him yeah. they well, gave him some cash to make it an even rack, you know. Sure. What did you have chores when you were little? Oh yes. My chores were to go after the cows to bring them up and that was Exactly five o'clock every evening, I'd go get the cows up and I'd help milk and I'd gather the eggs was my chores. And didn't worry about black snakes? Didn't worry about snakes. <laughs> I can't remember, you know, well, yeah. having snakes. We had uh, my dog went crazy if he saw a snake. Yeah, I mean, he'd grab it and shake it in his, ma his mouth and Curious sling thing. it, you know, and oh boy, you better be out of the way <laughs> when he slung it. <laughs> yeah, if she had a collie dog, it went with her a lot to get to Oh, count. yes. Her dog with a collie dog. Yeah. And did your brother have chores? A little bit different than yours? Well, yes, he did. Uh, he helped hay the cattle, and uh, I can't remember. I was little when my dad got rid of our horses. My dad never would let me down at the barn near the horses. He was always afraid when the horses got in the barn that I'd get trampled or something, you know. He was afraid I was going to get hurt, but he never would let me down there with the horses, so I'm sure my brother helped with that. My brother was six and a half years older than me, so he got to help Dad with the farming and everything. And then later, I, as I got older, I helped. I helped on the tractor and like that. Uh, in fact, one year I put the crop in because my dad had been operated on it and the doctor told him not to do any heavy lifting or anything for six months. So dad would hook the tractor up for me and I would, I went, and I worked the field and Did it so sowed the wheat that year. But it was just one year that I sold wheat, I guess. No, I helped. Dad had two tractors, and I helped him uh, then later. Yeah. I think he it was in 1942, is, uh, he said when they quit using the horses. Uh, he had a tractor before that, and I think your uncle was working for your dad, Betty, if I remember that, George Belger was working for your dad. And he broke a tug on the harness, and he come across the field telling her dad what happened. He said, well, just unhook them, drive the horses to the house. And uh, so they pulled a tool out of the field with the tractor, and they never did harness the horses up no more. I believe in 1942, mm -hmm. the last they did work in the field with horses. Tra tractors were something people were really remember. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. And that very was. first one they learned to drive. Yep, yeah, there's a... Uh, uh, you know, they come out on those steel lugs, you know what lugs were. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they, I remember when uh, they come with rubber tires, a lot of the old timers said, well, that'll never stay. Them lugs will just tear off those tires, they'll never stay. And if they could see today how wrong they were, you know, because the tread stays on the tires. But they thought that the tractor just pulled those tread off the tires, you know. They'd been used to those old steel lugs being on the wheels. My dad got his first tractor, I think, in the late 20s. I can remember Mom telling about they spent more time working on the tractor than the tractor worked in the field yeah, they, because it was always broken down. Yeah, they, and then he got a better tractor and he just kept yeah. a better tractor then. That's a major investment to Yes. Yeah. 
I yes, think they were around eight hundred dollars from what was taken in nineteen nineteen thirty seven. Your dad bought the W thirty, and it was a good tractor. In nineteen thirty seven, they was better then, and it didn't break down. In fact, the business that's what we started farming with. We bought his machinery when we started farming, and the way he set us up, I didn't have anything. See, and uh, when they quit farming, he said, "I want you to farm." and and he offered it to his son. His son said, no, Dad, I don't want to be a farmer. He's more electrician. That's what his line of work was. So he come to us and he said, do you want to farm? And I said, well, Lou, I can't buy your machinery. I don't have the money. And so we sat down at the eating table and he, he wrote it out, every item, what it's worth. And he showed it across the table to me and he said, you pay me when you can. And I think I paid him in two years, didn't I? I don't remember Something like how that. Long. I paid him in two years. And that's how we started farming. But we started with his machinery, thirty-seven model, and a and a forty-nine model. Two tractors is what we had. And when he bought the first case tractor, he gave forty-six hundred or forty-nine. 40, uh, I think it was forty-six hundred for the tractor and a full bottom plow. That's the first new one I bought. A neighbor told told us we was going to go broke because we spent all that money on that tractor. Well, we had to borrow the money. See, we didn't have the yeah. money, but I borrowed the money and bought it. And uh, one of our neighbors, of course, he's gone now, but he said, "You, you're going to go under." Said, "You can't make it giving that much money for machinery." And now then, you're looking at over three hundred thousand. And it <laughs> it was nothing but up. All the way from there. Yeah, thing just kept going up, seemed like. And, and was it a hard decision to, to spend that much? Well, no, because uh, the tractors it we was had needed. was, was uh, getting so bad shape that they, they wouldn't be able to make a crop with them. See, and uh, I still got the one uh, Oliver tractor. I still got it. Of course, I got rid of the W30. It was 37 model, but I got the, the Oliver out there now, and it still runs. In fact, I raked alfalfa hay with it not long ago. And I don't farm anymore. This, when her back give out, see, I had to quit farming this year. I don't farm anymore. I had to rent the land out. And so I put up the alfalfa with that little tractor. Usually done it on the rake. And it still runs good, you know, and, and everything. But uh, Did you learn how to do the repairs yourself? Yeah, we used to take the pan off and we'd uh, take and pull the cylinders out, you know, and put rings on there. Her dad helped me do that, too. We had to work the heads over because every year, you know, on a gas motor, the valves need to be ground. Yeah, you had to work, you had to do your own mechanic work. But I was, uh, the last time it was worked on, I brought the tractor to town and I had George Howard do it for me. You remember George Howard made it as well as I do? Well, yes, he did I that. Should. He did that work for me on the Oliver tractor. He even overhauled the motor. And that's the last it's been worked on, but it hadn't been used much. Well, in high school, had you planned to be a farmer? No, in high school, I didn't know what was going to happen to me because I, uh, see, like I say, I was born at Okima, and I come up here looking for work in the wheat harvest. When I got out of high school, I didn't go to college, but I was put in Class 1A, and they were drafting boys. The Korean conflict was going on, and I was in 1A, and I couldn't hardly find a job because of my classification. And uh, finally, I did get a job with the uh, Oklahoma Highway Department, working on the highway. And then in about a year, I was drafted. I had to go to the service. And uh, I didn't ever go to college. And then, like I say, when I come home from college, I worked a short period with the highway department. And then we got married, and, uh, and I started uh, farming on a smaller scale. I farmed one quarter for how many years there, Betty? Several years, you remember, and uh, I, mean, four I, I, five run, years. I done I run a motor grader, you know, in construction work, and uh, four or five years we just farm one place. Then when her father in 1963 said they're going to move to town, that's when we started farming two more quarters. There was three quarters that we started out with farming, you know. And, uh, Had you always hoped to stay with the family farm? Yes, more or less. Yeah, we, we had it kind of in our system. Uh, she did not go to college either. Uh, she worked in the bank and worked in a courthouse after she got out of high school. And uh, I don't know. Uh, 
They went to, all the kids in our bus didn't go to college, did they? Two or three of them went to college, I think. Well. They went but 12, no, 11 in our class, wasn't they? We went to a small school. They were just 11 graduated out of our senior class. Well, think, was it very close to your home, the school? Yes, uh, just about a mile and a half. And how would you get to school? Well, I rode the bus, but lots of times I'd walk to school. And my brother and I, we'd just walk to school because the bus, we was, the, I think, the last on the route to be picked up. And so we'd just walk. And it was nothing to us to walk. Well, did your parents have jobs off the farm, or what? Did no, they just make my parents. My folks never, had, just had, had, never had a job off the farm. But they, it's all together different now, you know. But uh, they uh, they just stayed on the farm and worked, you know, all the time. And then when you two got it, did, did you work other jobs too, or just? Yes, I did. Them? I worked as a carpenter. It was seventeen years I did carpenter work. If I wasn't in the field, I'd be doing something else because I had two kids in college at the same time, and I was short of money. <laughs> and I, I had that, I did 17 years of carpenter work, and the house there, <coughs> me and three neighbors built that house right there. And, uh, and that's when we built it in 79. <coughs> now, when we moved to town, the fellow that sold us the land, he was a builder, and he wouldn't let us build it. We had to let him build it. So we didn't actually build this house here. We, it was hard done by the guy that owned the land. But uh, yeah, we had done that 17 years, and that's my off-farm income. Called, yeah. I worked for the bank until my first daughter came along. And then I, I was a stay-at-home mom with my girls. I had first my old, the oldest girl, Kathy, in 19... 57, and then Linda was born in 58. The one that left here, yeah. Uh huh. And I, then I had another one in 59, and she uh, was still born. And uh, yeah. then I stayed at home and helped Hugh. He always needed help with farming, with the uh, machinery or something, always had to help him do things. And I canned and I, it was, I was always busy. <laughs> it kept me busy. Were the daughters in 4-H or? Yes, both of them have been in 4-H. Mm -hmm. And were you? Yes. Did you go to Stillwater for Roundup? No, I never did. And I don't think the girls did. They, I don't think they ever did. I was in FFA in 49 is when they started FFA at Okima. And I've got a, a program that we had. I've still got it in there. It shows a menu of what we had for supper that night in the program that we had in 1949. Are, do you know anyone at Okima at all? Mm -hmm. Well, the FFA teacher that taught me is still alive. I think he is. He's getting up pretty good age, but he's still alive. And they started the FFA program in 49. I think they had here Kingfisher a little quicker than that. And what was his name? Ray Holman. Oh. Ray Holman, H-O-L-M-A-N. He's still alive. Uh, he taught us, and uh, there was quite a bunch of us that took FFA. And uh, it's... Yeah. Take things to the county fair? Oh, yes. Yes, I had a project. I had a Poland uh, uh, China pig was my project. Uh, you know, I was just in uh, just a couple of years of FFA there. And then when come up here, they didn't have FFA at the school when we graduated. It was just 4-H, you know. Do you remember some of your projects? Well, I got... I think grand champion on my peaches that I canned and uh, blue ribbon on a suit I'd made. I made from, I think, one of my dad's suits. And uh, I don't remember. Uh, 
So sewing was this, part of it. Sewing was part of it. Mm -hmm. Sewing and canning. You enjoyed sewing? Oh, yes. Make the girls clothes? I always made the, the girls clothes until my oldest daughter, when she was about a eighth grader, she started sewing and she wanted to make her own clothes. And she did. And she did through high school. But... Uh, Where would you get your fabric in, in the Kingfisher? Well, we had... At that time, we had several local stores that sold fabric. We had lots more stores than what we have now. And uh, I don't think we have a, no, we don't have any place here in Kingfisher that sells fabrics. No. So we have to go like to Hennessy or to Enid or to Oklahoma City to buy fabric. Do they still yes. sew, either one of them? Uh, neither one of them has the time to sew. The youngest one, Linda, that just left a while ago, she never was much on sewing. She she made a real nice jumper one time for FHA, and uh, it was really a attractive jumper. But she sat at the sewing machine, and I mean, she made that thing zip the seam, and it turned out real nice, but she never would wear it then. <laughs> Did you teach them how to can? Well, no, not to extend. I, I don't, neither one of them, I think, cans. Not today they don't, but, but uh, Kathy helped you when we were on the farm in the garden. Well, yes, she did. She She'd always help. helped. She'd help with the garden Linda would help on, out on the tractor and stuff like that, but Kathy was always afraid of the tractor and everything, and she'd stay to the house, and she, she liked to fool in the garden and in the kitchen, and she she was real good help in the house. But Linda could do the same too. I mean, she was real good in the kitchen. The oldest daughter is a teacher at Enid. That's what she does. And she's son-in-law is retired. He taught 32 years, and he's retired now. And her daughter dropped out when her children was born, and she'll drop out and maybe retire two or three more years. I don't know when she'll retire. But she said, really, she uh, she could retire in three years, but she'd like to go 10. <laughs> so I don't know what don't she'll do. Either. And Linda is a nurse, and she just, uh, she's not working right now. And it was a good thing, because she's really been a blessing to me during the summer, you know. Uh, she's really helped me a lot. Well, when the when your parents had the farm, can you talk about some of the buildings that were there when they had it? Well, there really isn't any of the buildings there that was there when they had it, except a big round tin barn, and uh, there was a granary that you could drive through, and it had bins on both sides. And Dad would store his wheat and oats and whatever else in those bins. And during the winter, we'd butcher a beef, and he he would from the rafters, rafters uh, tie a rope and hang the beef there, and we'd eat off that beef for oh probably a couple of weeks or so, and then my mom would can the rest of it. She'd can, she'd can beef roast and hamburger patties and different things, you know. And um, I can remember coming home, and it was kind of late one time, and she opened a can of the beef, and it had kind of a gravy on it. And I thought, I've never tasted anything as good as that. 
It was really good. Oh, it's Billy. She, she canned an awfully lot. There's a, there's a, two buildings that your dad built out there, standing Bay, the Round Top Barn and the, what we call the Wash House. He built it in Well, years. yes. Um, Those are the only two buildings that your dad built. The only thing that's out there from her grandpa coming in 1900 is uh, that standing at the windmill. It was there when he come. And uh, the well is 100 foot deep and it's drilled. And we don't know how it was drilled or how they done it. But back then they done a lot of hand digging wells. Mm -hmm. On the quarter east of where we live, that well is 60 foot deep and it's hand dug. You know, and the water is delicious. Good water. We've had people from other places come and some young guys from, they was from Shawnee, they said, that's the best tasting water I've ever tasted. And I don't know, it was just water to us, but it did taste good. It was good tasting water. We've always had plenty of it, but we never did yes. waste it. I don't know at the time that I went special to make a trip just to turn a windmill off. We had several windmills out there at different places, you know, at five at one time. And uh, I'd make a trip just special to turn a windmill off so I didn't waste water. You know, when the tank gets full, you're just wasting water. And uh, so we always was conservative. But the home place, now it was right there easy and they'd just go out there a little ways and turn the windmill off, you know, so it was easy to control that. And, uh, uh, well, the wash the wash house was just for washing, or yeah. Well, we had a place we could shower. That's before we built the mom and dad built a bathroom in the old house, and uh, we had a place that we showered in there. Had hot water then. Yes. Yeah, had hot water. Hot water heater out there in it. Yeah. In fact, it's it's in that picture there. It's right east of the house there. I don't know if you can see it or not. It's still standing. And was there an outhouse? Yes. Well, a one seater or two? It was. Uh, it was two seater. <laughs> that uh, uh, that building you see right there in front of you, right there, that's a chicken house. And that's one of the first things her grandpa built. Of course, it didn't look like that. I tinned it and uh, everything. You know, it was just a wood built out of one by twelve. But that's the chicken house. So we raised chickens in it ourselves, and her parents did too. But the building that we're talking about, the wash house, is this building right here. It's got trees there. You don't see it real good, but that, right there was a shower on that north end, and it has a basement in there too, cellar. And, it, and then on the east side of it was a garage where we put the car. It was away from the old house. It wasn't attached. This house here now has a garage right here on the north end, and this is the driveway comes around, and you come into it from the east side. And this is the front of the house here. That's the one we built in 79. But the round top back there, you see, her daddy built that. And the one to the south over there, that other barn, that's one I built that. And uh, I guess I built just two buildings there, didn't I, Betty? Just the house and the hay barn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I moved the granaries. There was three granaries you see sitting back there. I put those up myself and uh, tore the chicken house down. And uh, Looks like you're using round hay, hay bales instead of the square, at, squares. At, at that time, it was round bales. Uh, they, when they come in, well, we got to where we couldn't get help putting little bales in the barn. And they uh, got good barn for small bales, but they're not, uh, you know, you, you don't get real high with those round bales. So I just stack them outside there. As, since round bales come in, well, people don't use a lot of little bales anymore on account of the labor part of it, you know. So it looks like there's some oil? Yeah, that's the quarter south of us. That's not on our place. That's the land south of us. Have there been any on, on your alls? Yeah, yeah, there's, it's, uh, you don't see it on, on there. On both places, on the east place and the home place. Yeah. The, the, and did that make a difference in the household finances when Oh, when my I goodness. Did? All yeah. the difference in the world, Was yeah. it your, your time or your parents' time? Well, it came in during my parents' time, but we're still getting. We share in it now, you know. 
and uh, uh, yeah, the oil income has been real good for us uh, because uh, without that, I don't believe we could have bought the land like we have. You know, we bought well, we got five quarters, and uh, without the oil money, it would have been a lot harder to do it. So that just makes all the difference in the world. Cause like I was telling you earlier, when my kid was in college, there's 17 years that I found in nails, and I needed money bad to stay afloat, you know. And so the oil has been a, a, a real big thing in our life, as far as, the, you know, financially. Do you remember when your parents were approached to, for them to drill, if it was an issue? I mean, did they even think, do we do this or not do this? No, I don't think it was an issue. I, well, they come to lease the land, and uh, they were really happy to do it because they'd never had anything like that before, you know. And, and people in our community didn't know too much about it because some of the oil companies, uh, they pulled shenanigans such as uh, given a blanket lease and that allowed them to put a pipeline side by side and people have learned a lot since then and uh, we never would do anything without going to attorney to let him fix it up you know and, uh, and uh, but they there were some people that got blanket lease signed and didn't know what they signed but it was a good thing for this area it helped a lot of people that they without the oil money they couldn't have done what they have done that's what mouth I don't know where you had raised, was there oil that where you had raised? No. I'm, no. No, of East Tennessee. No. Oh, East Tennessee. Oh, well. Well, <laughs> well it's a big, uh, big thing in this area. I guess Oklahoma is a state. It's a big thing for the state of Oklahoma. Do you remember them getting their first check and what they might have spent it on? No, I really don't. I didn't take a vacation or buy a new tractor or my yeah. folks never took that many vacations we have never taken many vacations i don't think we've ever taken a vacation until the girls was in uh high school and we went to see his friend in illinois and i think that was about our first vacation i remember her dad saying you know, if we could just get a $50 check, oil check, how that would really help. And they didn't have it, because there was none, you know. But they come in and leased, started leasing, and they drilled out there on, before he passed away, he got a few oil checks before he passed on. And it was pretty good checks. And he just, you know, he didn't know what to do, because he'd never had anything like that before. And he never spent, I think he traded cars, didn't he? He had a stroke, and he did trade his car, Betty, before he yeah. passed away. The car was pretty new when he when he passed away, but he didn't didn't have no need. He didn't know he didn't spend it because he never did have it before. He didn't know what to do, you know. He just more or less kept it. <laughs> but did your did your parents trust the banks, or did they hide money in the house? No, they trusted the banks. They did, yeah. They trusted we had a the real banks. good banker, and Dad. My dad had really liked him, and he seemed to like my dad a lot too. That's the bank where she worked. Uh -huh. and she was coming up in, yeah. <laughs> and how did they keep track of records through the years? How has that changed? Well, back then they do it kind of like I do it now. They'd keep it down on on a book. They'd write things in a book. And uh, we're not computer people yet. Now our kids are. We're computer. Everything's computer with we're, them. We're computer <laughs> literate. And I keep my records uh, in a ledger book about this big. And we get our bank statements from the bank each month. And what I spend, I put down that's tax deductible. If there's something that's not tax deductible, then I don't put it in my book. And then I go. Usually, you know, we got to do our taxes in February. It has to be completed in February, your farmer does. And I take it to this fella, and and he figures it up for me. And, and uh, we always pay our taxes in the month of February, internal revenue and state tax. That's different. We don't have no computers. It's all done with a ledger book. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
are your are your does your children your, they're farming the land now? No, you lease it. You lease the land. Lease it to them. Yeah. yeah. They don't. They, they don't, don't own farm. it yet. They will. Uh, they will own it behind us. We like to say uh, we've got it fixed in their trust, and uh, uh, when we conk out, it'll be theirs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're not farming them. No. They're farming it right now. They have farmed it, but uh, uh -huh. son in law he's got an oil job and, and he uh, he tied up quite a bit. He always talked about it. he didn't have no time for anything. And they send him to Utah sometimes for a couple of weeks or so with his work, you know. And so he didn't want to farm it no more and so he told me it's rented out somebody else. And but they may I may have a grandson that'll farm someday. Yeah. He just started being a highway patrol. He they had this, he was in the class that graduated in August. And he's out at Beaver now. He's on the job, Beaver County. He's a highway patrolman. He's 24 years of age, and I think there's some indication he might farm someday. I got two older grandsons. Could care less. They're computer people. Well, I don't know. Kyle might. Well, be, they, but they, I don't uh, think Drew isn't. Uh, we got one grandson who lives in Austin, Texas. Yeah. He works for mm -hmm. one old gas company. His wife, a school teacher. I don't think they'll ever be interested in farming. But the one that lived at Guthrie, their oldest one, he might, if he gets the opportunity, I don't know how it'll be, he married a farm girl from Boy City, a mountain in Panhandle. She's a farm girl. and uh, So I don't know, but we might have a grandson that'll farm. They want to build a house out there on the East Quarter someday for him. I don't know whether they need to or not. We think that one house on there is enough, but when we're gone, they'll do what they want to do, see. <laughs> I'm sure they enjoyed coming back to the farm for holidays and things. Oh, yes. Yeah, they do. They like that. Uh, yeah, go down we, the, we got a, one of the farms has a creek that runs through it, and our grandsons always liked, I never, I always told them we wouldn't go until it frosted where there wasn't any snakes or any yeah. thing, you know, to bother us. And they liked to go down there and we would walk the creek and, and you know, just talk and see different things and see tracks, turkey tracks and deer tracks and I'd point them out and show the boys and they, they really thought that was something. And then they liked to gather up wood and we'd have wiener roasts and they looked forward to that. My grandson, one grandson had called up and said, Grandma, let's have a wiener roast. And I'd say, okay, <laughs> and I had to keep all the stuff on hand out there at the farm so we'd be sure and have for wiener roast. <laughs> they always enjoyed that. We didn't hear about wild hogs so much now. There's wild hogs in our area now, but uh, we didn't hear of them a few years ago, you know. But there are some wild hogs in that area. Uh, not bad, but some, you know. Well, what would you do for fun back in when you were a little girl there on the farm? As a little girl, oh, I used to, I don't know, make believe everything. I'd see a movie and then I'd go out behind the barn or behind the chicken house and act out the movie and crazy kid. <laughs> but. That's kids for you. Would they let you swim in the ponds? Was that? No, I okay. never did swim in the pond. We've got a tank out there, a stock tank. Oh, it's pretty good long. I think it's about 20 foot by 14 wide. And you'd swim in that a lot. Yes, I did. As a little girl, I get in that. They'd clean it out, and that's where the men would take yeah. their bath here. They'd clean the it out every so often in the summertime and run fresh water in there. and. Well, that's I. That's where I swam. I swam in the creeks and the ponds when I was little, and for my recreation, I rode horse a lot. We'd be the neighbor kids. We didn't have money, 
but we really had a good time together. We'd ride our horses and we'd play different games and uh, made our own entertainment. We played a lot of mumble peg. You ever heard of that? You'd, uh, you'd spin the tops. A mumble peg, you'd just do it with a pocket knife, you know. you drive, have to get down and pull that peg out of the ground with your mouth, you know. And it was it was quite a deal. We entertained ourselves uh, with different games, you know, because we'd go to town once a week. Yeah, sometime we wouldn't go then, but uh, usually on Saturday was the day we went to town when I was growing up as a little boy. And uh, my mother would never go to the grocery store until she got her cream check. She didn't have no money, so she'd, she'd wait and get her cream check. Then she'd go downtown and do what little bit she needed. All the do. stores stayed open in the summertime till about, Saturday. I guess, about 10 o'clock. And as a little girl, uh, growing up in the summertime, especially well in the winter time, but in the summertime we'd come of an evening to town if it wasn't harvest time, and we'd go to the movie, and then there was the ice cream parlor just off Main Street, and I can remember getting orange sherbet as a little girl, and I thought, oh, that was the best stuff. <laughs> I ever tasted. Yeah. We had homemade ice cream on the 4th of July a lot of times because... Uh, we had it about once a week when I was growing up. We didn't have it that often. Because we had our own cream and eggs and milk and plenty of it. And we always had ice cream ever so often. And angel food cake? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my mom would make from scratch a dozen eggs. Usually it took great big, your big eggs, the whites of them. And, oh, she'd make good angel foods. <laughs> good anything. My mom was a great cook. <laughs> Even uh, uh, we had chickens for a few years when we got married and moved out on the farm there. And we would always take a, a 30 dozen case of eggs and we'd go to Cashin, which is over north, you know, southeast here. You've heard of Cashin. We'd go over there and, and uh, Betty would, he'd buy the eggs from us and Betty would buy the groceries from us. And uh, she'd always have extra money, you know, to have on hand from the uh, egg. But we never sold cream. Our cream went to Enid. Up at the gold spot at Enid is where that went, you know. And, but, uh, my mother would always, what money she'd get from the, from the cream, she'd come home with enough money because through the country then, there'd be a Watkins man come around or a Raleigh man. He'd have a horse and buggy maybe, or latter years he might have come in a car, and he'd sell all pepper and all spices, different kinds of spices, and she'd always buy some of them from him, you know. And I don't know, didn't they have that here too? Oh, they? yeah. They'd come through the country and want oh, to yeah. buy. Uh, did they do that back in Tennessee? And Not in my you know, regulation, but I'm sure they did. Yeah. Well, she'd always have enough money, and then they'd have enough money, you know, a little bit for Sunday school. Door-to-door -door salesman? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So it was church important then? If you... Yeah, the church was at the schoolhouse. See, I went to a one-room school when I was little, and it was just went through one through eight. Well, it's called a primer grade. We went uh, through the primer grade, which is like kindergarten now. But it was uh, just a one-room school. And uh, that's where they had church. It was gathering. And everything was done at the schoolhouse for the community. Now, in town, they had a different way of life, you know, in town. They'd have uh, different churches in town. Anyway, our school was just, everybody went to the schoolhouse to go to church, you know, on Sunday and Sunday night. They'd have revivals, and they also would build, once in a while, they'd build a, a church arbor <coughs> out there on the school ground. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. They'd just take and gather a bunch of brush and throw it up on some poles, and they'd have a church under there, singing and everything. They called it church arbor. It's on the school ground there is where they had it. What denomination? <laughs> we were Baptists. I don't know what denomination. Well, everybody went to the same place. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it was uh, no. It wasn't 
Well, I don't know. In our community, there was no Catholic, I don't think. Now, Betty, her oh, family. Well, in our community, there was Catholics. Yes. Yeah. And, they, and had, they, of course, went to church here in town. They come. Her grandpa but, lived out there nine and, and uh, three quarters miles, and he was a real staunch Catholic, her grandpa was. And he raised his children as Catholics, and they'd have to come to town with horse and buggy. You know, from out there, they'd come into church. And uh, they uh, used to talk about how thirsty they'd get going home. The roads would be dusty, you know, and it'd be so hot in the summertime. And they'd, get, they'd just have to take their water in a jug, you know, and it'd be hot to drink, you know. And they persevered. <laughs> Take, take them a while to go nine and a half miles, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they had a what's called a trotting team, and they would just they were bred to trot and pull a buggy. You know, they had a two seated buggy with the top over, it. and in the winter they had side curtains they put on it, and that's where the transportation. But you know, uh, they could trot and never get tired. They'd trot all the way from town out home, and then they'd just go, and that was it. They'd take one big breath. They were bred for that. They called them trotting teams. And the workhorse now is different. They were big, but these horses were small, and they, uh, that's what's called a trotting team. And they were bred for it. Just pull a buggy and just trot right on down. Have you ever been around any of the Amish people? Mm-hmm. Well, there's the Amish settlement in the southeast part of Oklahoma, and then you go up to Missouri, east of, east of uh, Springfield. There's quite a settlement of them, and they use those horses and buggies yet. And you see them, they're always trotting. They don't walk. Those horses are trotting. They're bred for that, you know, just, and that's what her grandpa had then, their trotting team. <laughs> and they'd come home from church and have what to eat, usually. Well, I can remember mom saying, and uh, well, my daughters have the crocs now, but she said my mom had always, on Saturdays, baked nine apple pies. And uh, at that time, I'm sure those littler tins, you know, like you can remember those little tins. And she said she'd bake nine apple pies and a five gallon crock of donuts and a two gallon crock of sugar cookies. And that, I guess, for the week, you know. And she said, it was always so good. They uh, they always had people around. We always it seemed like well, my mom and dad, uh, anybody that stopped in around noon, they was invited to eat dinner. You know, favorite area. Yeah, yeah. and uh, lots of times the guy that delivered gas and <laughs> managed to be there. <laughs> for at noon and just different, you know. We always had company at noon, it seemed like. And my mom always was prepared, it seemed like. And we did, to some extent, have extras quite a bit of time. Yeah, we, when we built that house there in 79, uh, Betty fed the crew dinner every day. Yeah. It, it come. And she'd always have dinner for them, and of course, whenever we'd have people helping with the hay, well, I'd always fed them, you know. Fed so them that was a tradition. dinner and supper. Yeah, they'd usually. usually eat dinner and supper, but the boys that helped on the house there, they just ate dinner there. They yeah. didn't eat supper, they'd go home for supper, you know. But we always fed, and we was raised that way, you know. If you weren't for now, nobody, you eat with people them. don't cook, you know, like that for helpers that no. come. They don't do it I don't anymore, you know. Well, would you it's, vary the menu or would it be chicken every day? Oh, no, it'd be varied. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'd always butcher it. When we lived out on the farm, we had chest-type deep freeze and we had plenty of beef. And she could have... Uh, and chicken. Yeah, we had chicken and beef and sometimes she'd get some fish. That was kind of a treat for us to have fish. But uh, also, she'd buy a pork once in a while, too. We'd have some pork chops, but... We had plenty of chicken and beef at all times, but uh, that was kind of tradition. If they worked for you, you fed them. That's the way it was, you know. But you canned extra, knowing that you would be doing that too. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. You have extra. Always have extra on hand. 
always run to the basement and get something, you know, pickles or your vegetables or anything like that. And eat, we even dug our own potatoes and uh, usually by summertime, well, you could dig potatoes during the summer, but during the wintertime, we'd store them for as long as they kept, you know, uh, and as long as we had any, it could just go to the basement and get some potatoes. It wouldn't take too long to have potatoes. My folks uh, just, and my grandparents too, uh, you know, they had a tradition uh, when it come meal time, the old folks ate first, and uh, they always would put them at the dining table. And whenever they get through eating, then they, the kids could eat. Now, other people done it just the other way. They feed yeah. the kids first, and the my folks would... always fed the kids first. Yeah, that was a different tradition. And then the, the adults could eat. But now, when we have people here, we set up card tables in here, and the area they can eat out on the back porch at that table. We all eat same time now, but back when I was a kid, I remember standing around and I'd look in there with them people ever going to get through eating. We'd have to wait to see as a little kid. We always had to eat late. And I don't know why the folks, that was a tradition. Yeah, all the neighborhood did that way. I mean, you didn't put a kid at a card table or another place. You ate, the kids ate at the table, but they'd have to eat after the older folks. It was just different tradition, you know, the way they raised. They're the ones who worked the hardest first, I guess. I guess that they, they were the providers. They got to eat first. <laughs> well, yeah. my family, the kids, was fed first. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier, you know, about the way you killed chickens. My mother didn't do like Betty's mother did. She would pick up a chicken or fire, and she'd just twist that neck like that and throw it out there, and that's it. She'd, she'd wring their neck. But Betty's mother would cut their neck off with a butcher knife. She had a different way of doing things. Everybody had their own way of doing things, you know. And uh, we didn't have electricity where well, the folks would butcher. In the wintertime, we'd butcher, you know, a pork. We always raised hogs, and then they'd salt it down, and it'd keep till we eat it up, you know. Usually in the spring, it'd be gone, but we'd have pork all through the winter because it'd be in the smokehouse, and it'd keep out there in the smokehouse, you know. And uh, no refrigeration at all. <laughs> And we made it fine, though. Well, my folks used to have hogs. Well, I was just still little. But Mom got sick, and the doctor told her to lay off of pork, not to eat pork so much, you know. And so Dad quit raising hogs, then, and where we used to have the pork and the beef and the chickens, like I say, if we got fish, that was a treat. Well, where would you get the fish? Out of the pond. Out. You'd have to catch them. Yeah. Yeah, the folks didn't buy fish. <laughs> it was mostly just uh, catfish, mud cats, we call them. That's what we'd have. That was a treat, though, to have fish. How many biscuits and scrambled eggs for breakfast? Well, we had. Oh, breakfast. Mom always. My mom always fixed a big breakfast. She believed in that everyone needed a good breakfast to get the day started. And I still think, probably, and I think it's proven that kids do better in school if they start out with a good breakfast. And anyway, my mom always saw to it. We had plenty to eat. We had eggs, however you wanted to fix them, and bacon usually, or ham, something like that. Yeah, that was a And uh, usually homemade bread. She would make four loaves of bread every other day, and it'd be gone during that length of time. And, uh, of course, like I say, we always had quite a bit of company. And for breakfast, she would toast the bread. And lots of times I can remember milk toast. And I, to me, that 
that was really good. I really enjoyed it. The hot milk on the toast, you know, and it soaks up and eat it and I put sugar on it. And I'm not positive, but probably cinnamon. My and, mother. Uh, my just mother. different breakfast pancakes. And I can remember my mom making apple fritters for Sunday night supper. And she would slice the most apples and, you know, that she'd slice them in rings about that thick and sugar them and let it kind of juice up. Then she'd use a juice in the batter and it was kind of like a pancake with the apple in it. And then you sugar it real good and we'd have a platter stacked high and the four of us could eat that platter of apple fritters at one sitting. <laughs> it was so good. But I think probably on Sunday evening it, that was probably all we ate was the apple fritters. Because usually Sunday evenings you ate a big dinner and everything. And so there, we, that was our supper. My mother was a little bit different. She would have biscuits for breakfast, but for dinner and supper, we'd have cornbread. That was what she was raised on, and that's kind of the way she raised us. And uh, we had a lot of beans. We eat a lot of beans and cornbread and onions, and we put vinegar on our beans. You know, vinegar tastes good on them. And my mother was a great hand to feed us spinach. She liked to feed us spinach. And have you ever heard of poke salad? My mother fed us a lot of poke salad too. And uh, we liked that stuff. It was just a little bit different tradition uh, than what her mother was yeah. raised. Yeah, my mom, when we had beans, we always had potatoes and gravy or fried potatoes and meat and a salad, and then of course fruit. We we were big fruit eaters. Yeah. And there were and fruit trees on the property. Well, no, not really. We, didn't, uh, uh, we just had a She'd fruit. buy, I know one year she canned, was 14 bushels, bushels of peaches. Uh, now that's just peaches. and. And she canned 14 bushels of peaches, put them in quart jars, and lots of times half gallon jars is what we'd have them in. And uh, she canned apples, and she canned pears, and the applesauce, and she'd make pickles, the peach pickles, the, uh, all kinds of cucumber pickles, and beet pickles. And I don't know what else. We're that way today. It's we just, like beets. Yeah. Her and I really love beets. Now, our kids are not so much on them, but we like beets. Well, they do too. They both love beet pickles. Well, the grandkids, I don't know if they care for them that much. Well, too. I don't know whether they eat them that much. But Betty and I eat beets. I really like them, yeah. Well, they go good with pinto beans and cornbread. They go good. They're good with anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That may be some of the difference since yours came from Arkansas and you're more north come down. So maybe mm -hmm. it's different, different. different tradition, yeah. My uh, my folks uh, talk about the older folks should be my grandparents, I guess. Like I say, I never did know them because they passed away before I was born. But they would have a tradition when they'd have beans, the uh, grandma would fix a bowl of melted hog lard. She'd eat it up and melt it. And she'd put a tablespoon in there. And whenever they'd put that down at the table, they'd take that tablespoon and they'd throw a, a spoonful of that hog lard on their beans and their cornbread. Now you'd think that would they wouldn't live to be old people. And they didn't live to be too old. The oldest one lived to be ninety four. But that was a tradition back then. The people up in this part of the country here never hear of that, you know, using hog lard on just melt it and put it on there for seasoning, make it taste better. When Betty makes beans today, she buys pork and puts little chunks of pork in there, you know, for seasoning. She don't 
do like the overcoat you could do. Like but fat back. I grew up with yeah. fat back in the, fat back, in the yeah. beans. That was good seasoning. Mm -hmm. Good tasting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And just butter itself isn't too bad. <laughs> no, it's good seasoning, you know. School kids today. She's not asleep over there. <laughs> no, it's a very comfortable chair, though. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> they talk about the school kids uh, being obese today, you know, and, and they're changing their diet so much in the schools. I don't know how that's going to work. Uh, uh, the kids nowadays has too many different choices. We used to eat what was in front of us, and uh, I don't know, it's a kind of a going thing now at the schools. They're changing their diet around. The agriculture department is interested in that too because it's come from the agriculture department. And uh, they serve breakfast at the schools now, and uh, I don't know if they're giving them enough, really the right kind of food or not, but they're giving them what they want them to have. Uh, you girls over there at Stillwater, do you hear much about that at the school? You don't, we have. I have. You haven't heard mm -hmm. much about that. It's been changing nationwide. I think the administration talks about that. They don't want no obese school children. Well, I know uh, they talked about taking away uh, machines, bending machines, yeah. and changing yeah. what was in them to get healthier yeah. Change, choices. So. so, Might be for the best. I don't know what it is or not, but. Well, back in, in your all's youth, you worked it off. Yeah, no we matter did. matter what you ate, we you sweated a lot. It off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now then, you know, the kids don't sweat. They are in air conditioning. If they, even the farmers, they go out to the field, they're in air conditioning, you know, in the tractor cabs. And uh, the kids don't sweat anymore. They got air conditioning in the cars. And uh, we used to do a lot of sweating, putting up hay. We did a lot of it. And the folks before us did more than we did. And then the generation before, like her grandparents, they they had no air conditioning, never heard of it. They might have had a fan at church, they'd give you a fan when you went in, you done like this. That's the only cooling you got with you. Fan yourself. That's all they had. And then whenever you left church, you left your fan there. You didn't, you didn't take it home. <laughs> you left it there. <laughs> right, for the next time. Yeah, you next time. They pass out those fans when you come in. Sit there and do like this while the preacher was preaching. <laughs> well, that's the only way they could keep cool. Yeah, that, it helped, you know. Uh, that's what they done. Yeah. Well, we've covered a lot today. Is there anything else you want to add before we sign off? Oh, I don't know. Anything you want to add? I just. I often wonder myself, as many changes as we've seen, uh, how many more is going to be, we'll never know. But there's going to be change. Uh, there always has been. Uh, you know, we've seen them uh, in the 60s when they went to the up there and uh, seen a lot of different machinery changes. Uh, like I say, combines today is $350,000. Bigger machine, do more work. And uh, I bought a new one in 75, give 20,000 new combine. And I thought that was an astronomical amount of money, you know. And it was for that day and age. My mother was born in 1900, and she died in 1996. And she saw everything from the horse and buggy to the man on the moon. Yeah. And Airplanes come all in. in between. <laughs> Gosh, I can remember. As a little kid, uh, uh, being outside, and the P-38 would come over, and I thought I'd never seen nothing look like that is uh, during the war. You know, they'd fly those P-38s. It was two, two, you know, it was they had two bodies to them. Did you ever know what a P-38 is? Well, it's a different kind of a plane. And I thought, boy, that's really something. They could build something like that and stay together. Instead of just having one straight body, this one they had two side by side. It was called P-38. And uh, you don't see them anymore. But uh, now it's all jets. But that is something to see if, uh, you know, go to the moon and, uh, and uh, the way things have been. I often wonder what another 50 years will be or another 100, but we won't know, see. Yeah. But they're talking about reversing some of that, like bringing the trains back. You know, they, yeah. trains were important out in this area for a long time. You know, we get a lot of trains come through our town here. They, they
they go from up north here, I don't know how far, but they go all the way to Houston, I think. And they haul a lot of wheat on the track here. They come from Enid and they take wheat down to the Gulf, you know, and ship it out. There's, there's a lot of trains come through, more than there used to be. And uh, the, all of our stuff, about all of our food is shipped by truck anymore, though. They used to haul a lot of food on the trains, you know, too. But uh, I think most of it's done by trucks. But uh, I don't know what changes we'll see. Uh, we may see a day coming whenever you get on a apparatus and it'll raid off the ground. You just fly over the houses and come back down. You know, they, I don't know what's going to be, but I think that's coming. Transportation is going to advance. Uh, I think. I don't know whether I'd learn to drive one of those or not. I had a hard time driving one of those carts in Walmart's. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't use the walker at that time and in the Walmarts and I rode one of those carts and I thought, boy, if we had to have a driver's license for this, I'd never well, pass. Motorized deals, you know, they yeah. got the Walmarts, she got on that. She never did I, operate one. I had never op even seen one operated, exactly. how they operated it. They're electric. And I think Linda got a laugh out of me. She had to take a picture of me on it anyway. Quite a ways from a tractor, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'd never pass a driver's test on that. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Well, if there's nothing else, we thank you so much for sharing well, your memories with us you're today. You're quite welcome. Yeah, ready to do it. Been a pleasure. It's, uh,